Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Network Sunday, May 26th, 2019. This is episode 1595. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by LastPass, the number one most preferred password manager. Just remember your master password, and LastPass remembers the rest. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Oh, yes, tech guy time. Tech guy time. Grab the kids. <laughs> Get them the heck out of the house. Tech guy time. <laughs> time to talk computers and the internet and home theater. We got digital photography. We got smartphones. We got smart watches. We got all that stuff. All that stuff. If you want to uh, call and uh, participate in the show, be part of the show, you're my co-host, you know. All you have to do is call 8888-ASK-LEO, 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Outside that area, you can uh, still reach me, but you have to use Skype out to do it or something like that. But because it's a toll-free number, it shouldn't cost you anything. 8888-ASK-LEO. Uh, we do have a website, which I'm proud to say is free, open to all, no sign-up or anything, and it's there uh, all the time. You know, Websites never close. So you can, if you hear something on the show and go, what? <laughs> I want to know more, or I don't want to know more, or I have a correction, the website is there for you, techguylabs.com. It's me. It's in my lab. I'm in my lab, Tech Guy. I'm the Tech Guy. I'm in the lab, techguylabs.com. Uh, and that's all free. And it has a link to our chat room. It has a link to the phone number. You don't have to remember anything, really, frankly. Just techguylabs.com. That's it. Uh, we've been talking about the city of Baltimore uh, over the last few days. It is uh, broken. <laughs> they, they broke Baltimore uh, under a cyber attack. Thousands of computers frozen for the last three weeks. Email shut down. Nobody can buy a, a house, pay their water bill. Many, many of the city services shut down by ransomware. And according to the New York Times today, uh, a key component of the malware that the bad guys used to hack the computers in the city of Baltimore were developed. Uh, this is, I'm reading from the New York Times. Quote, at taxpayer expense, a short drive down the Baltimore-Washington Parkway at the National Security Agency. It's Eternal Blue is the name of the exploit, and it's an exploit that attacks Windows machines, older ones, and uh, can be used to spread malware from computer to computer. One of the keys uh, on malware like this is that somebody in the city of Baltimore, oh, you know, opened an email with an attachment that infected that computer. But that by itself, you know, one computer infected, big deal for you at home, not such a big deal for a big business or a city because they have other computers, right? They take that computer out, the IT guy wipes it and starts over. But with the help of the National Security Agency and the internal blue hack, it spreads through the network like wildfire almost instantly and... That's how you take down a business, or in this case, a city government. And it's not just Baltimore; it's actually spreading all over. The uh, how did they get? How did the bad guys get Eternal Blue? We don't know the exact details, but somebody, probably a nation state, going by the name of the Shadow Brokers got the a big trove, a cache of NSA exploits. So to understand this, you have to understand that our government and every government is, you know, has their hackers or their tame hackers working for them. And the uh, tame hackers are constantly looking for ways to break into computers, not to attack you and me. Well, unless you're a spy <laughs> or, a, or a, you know, somebody in the government, you know, somebody important. 
They're not after. They're not after our credit card numbers. They're not after our social security numbers. It's not identity theft. They're working at. They're trying to get in and uh, and do either economic damage or espionage, cyber warfare. And we're doing it too. And so the exploits that the NSA came up with are all really for targeted attacks. Like uh, that, what I just kind of described, which is you spearfish a company, you get a, you get a malware in there, and you use additional tools like Eternal Blue to spread the malware. When uh, it, uh, We believe, we're not exactly sure, but it seems to be an a, uh, NSA contractor took all of this stuff he put it on a floppy disk, and it well, and he took it. He took it to his house, which you're not supposed to do. So, he did. He broke the law. Then he wasn't doing it for spy. He just wanted to work at home for a little bit. He had we, and again, this is all somewhat speculative, but I I think it's fairly reliable. He had on his system an antivirus called Kaspersky, which was created by a Russian company called Kaspersky Labs, <clears throat> and it did what many antiviruses do. It quarantines the virus and sends it back to the home office. In this case, the home office was in Moscow. <laughs> and so it's often thought that the shadow brokers are actually the Russian, you know, secret police. They got it and then leaked it out because that's how the Russians like to operate. You know, if if the Koreans had gotten it, North Koreans had gotten it, they'd keep it to themselves. The Chinese, they'd keep it to themselves. But uh, for some reason, the shadow brokers tried to, it was a weird thing, tried to blackmail and then eventually released all of the NSA exploits. And there were some juicy ones in there, including this eternal blue. Since that happened, and that happened, what, two, three years ago? Um... Yeah, 2017. Um, since that leak, Eternal Blue, according to the Times, has been used to spread malware that has paralyzed hospitals. Air, you remember? It happened in L.A., right? Airports, rail and shipping operators, the shipping line Maersk, for instance, ATMs, factories that produce critical vaccines, and... It turns out local governments like Baltimore are really vulnerable because they have aging infrastructure. They're not super sophisticated. If you go to the Baltimore website, you'll see the city of Baltimore is currently unable to send or receive email. <laughs> if you need assistance, call us. <laughs> call us. <clears throat> now, Baltimore has, I quite correctly refused to pay the $100,000 ransom. So, by the way, when there's a ransom, that kind of implies it might, it's not a nation state using it now. It's, it's just guys who want to make some money, make a little dough on the side. But often when you pay the ransom, you don't get anything. And all it does is encourage them. So it's generally accepted that you shouldn't pay the ransom. Although I saw a recent study, <clears throat> I think it was by a Motherboard, that said in most cases when you hire a company to help you with a cyber attack, with a ransomware attack, they just pay the ransom and then upcharge you. Hey, it's a profit deal, right? <sighs> FedEx lost $400 million to not Petya, which used Wanna Blue, or, uh, Eternal Blue. Remember Wanna Cry? That paralyzed, that same thing, used Eternal Blue. That was a North Korean attack. You Paralyzed the British healthcare system, German railroads, 200,000 organizations around the world. Russia used not Petya, which is a variant, against the Ukraine. Merck lost $670 million, big pharmaceutical company. <laughs> Hotel Wi Fi networks were compromised using Eternal Blue. This is the problem, and it's an important thing to note. When. Um, you know, this isn't going to stop the NSA and probably other government agencies from working on hacks because it's a very useful spy tool for them. But there, uh, there's a side effect to this. And this is, the, this is kind of the issue also with the move, which is afoot around the world, even here in the U.S., to eliminate encryption or to put back doors in encryption, Right. Remember the FBI wanted the FB the uh, Apple folks to put a backdoor in the iPhone so they could get some data out of uh, out of an iPhone. Um, the Australian government, the Russian government, many governments have ruled that encryption is illegal. You need to always well, you can ha oh no, 
I'm sorry. You can have encryption, but we need to be able to see into it. So you always have to put a back door. But there's the problem. <clears throat> if the NSA can't keep Eternal Blue secret, how are they going to keep the back door secret? Not just Baltimore, by the way. Allentown, Pennsylvania, San Antonio, Texas. Last July, almost a year ago, Department of Homeland Security issued a warning that state and local governments were getting hit by particularly destructive malware that has apparently started relying on Eternal Blue. New from the NSA. <clears throat> uh, I don't, you know, there's, there's bad guys galore in this story. But it's important to understand that just because it's the government that has custody of these doesn't mean they're going to stay secret. And a back door is a bad idea. Enough said. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. Let's talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. <clears throat> yeah, we've never been bit, but I, I would hesitate to say we'll never be bit because <clears throat> you can block everything on the firewall and you can whitelist the sites and all that stuff. But <clears throat> email is the real challenging vector. We uh, we use security like uh, Cisco Umbrella and uh, the Sophos uh, firewalls to block malware attachments, but they have the same problem. Uh, all all anti malware does, which is zero days. You know they can only uh, block malware they know about, and if it's a zero day, they won't know about it. Now I think we can probably block not pet you. <laughs> um, so it's a it's a hard thing to do. <clears throat> what you want, what you hope is uh, just like you say, Aaron K. You have a uh, you have a uh, good backup. A uh, immutable backup. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you, direct from Las Vegas, Nevada, <laughs> the unbreakable Kimmy Schaffer, our... <laughs> it's about time for me to get back to Phone angel. Vegas. I haven't been there since I was 23. What? <laughs> yeah, it's been a long direct time. Direct from the hot air balloon that didn't fly that didn't, festival. That didn't do that either. <laughs> Direct from just down the road. Hello, Kimmy Schaffer, Phone Angel. How are you doing? Uh, I'm very well. How are good. you? Yeah. Good, good. Yeah. Sam's coming up, our, our car guy. I can't wait to tell him about our new car that we just got. I'm looking for a car. Look out the window. You'll see a very blue car. I was looking at a blue car, too. <laughs> it's <laughs> an electric blue car. But we'll talk about it in a few minutes. Yeah. But first, I should get a call on just, you know, to show that I listen to the All people. Right. Uh, how about Johnny in Hotlanta? Hotlanta. He, he wants to know um, what's your take on texture being replaced by Apple News. Oh, yeah. That's a good question, isn't it? Yep. Mine yeah. too. Thank you, Kim. Hello, Johnny. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. How are you doing today? I am well. How are you? Good. Before I get started, I was, now you're talking about cars. I just purchased a 2019 Ford Ranger. Oh, nice car, huh? You like it? I love it so far, but I love the uh, Ford Sync application. Oh, good. Uh, you know they've got, they went through some hard times I think a little bit because they did my Ford Touch. Ford Sync was uh, ba based on Microsoft's car platform, and then they did my Ford Touch, which they did in, in house, and everybody hated that. But I think they've gotten back to their roots with Sync. So I'm glad you I'm glad to hear you like it. Yeah, I've got because I have the Google uh, Fi or, uh, phone, or the you know and I've got I mean the Pixel phone, and I've got the Apple phone. Uh, so I really like the fact that I can use both of them. You know, oh, does it support? Android it supports Auto Android Auto and CarPlay. Yes, yeah, I think. I mean, I, I think I, that's a must. I'm just a big fan. So, yeah. So I'm really pleased. But anyway, my question to you is: is I've had a texture subscription since they get they offered me a promotional rate of seven ninety nine. Nice. I guess about a year or two ago, and I, you know, you used to you used to be one of your sponsors. They sure did. And, uh, and so, you know, I thought, well, I'll give this a try because I always liked your spiel about, hey, I feel guilty. My magazine's just Yeah, waiting. right. So when I have this, I get it on my class. Now, that's a good reason because I feel guilty, too. So I got it, and I do I do read it some. I can't say I'm addicted to it, but, uh, you know, it's been nice to be able to pull up your magazines when you want to. But now that they're going over to Apple News, I'm wondering, what is your spill on that uh, now that texture is going away? 
Yeah, so Apple bought them for a couple hundred, uh, I think it was a couple hundred million dollars. Texture was created by the magazine companies. Condé Nast, Hearst, Meredith, News Corp, Rogers, which is up in Canada, and Time, Inc. And it was really their response to what they saw as a crisis for print magazines that digital was just going to put them all out of business. They said, well, what's our digital strategy? It's the same reason Hulu exists, right? It's the television networks. What's our digital strategy? Uh, it's frankly, I mean, I'm going to be honest, is why iHeartRadio exists. Radio stations. What's our digital strategy? That's a question every business these days has to ask. What's our digital strategy? What are we going to do? Uh, and it was a good deal. You got seven ninety nine. It ended up being, I think, ten bucks uh, for normal folks. Didn't get in early for unlimited access to two hundred magazines. Correct. Apple Apple bought it in March, and they're going to shut down at the end of this month. Actually, day after tomorrow. Two days. They, they keep sending me an email every day saying, yeah. okay, this is the last two days. Last so day. you can yeah. get effectively the, almost exactly the same thing if you're on iOS, but only on iOS with Apple's News Plus subscription. Same price, same magazines. It, it is pretty much the same interface. They haven't changed a thing. Uh, I, I subscribed. I made the move over and then because it got a free month and then I canceled it. Okay. Because, I'll tell you why, stuff in Apple News is, is, is trapped inside Apple News. Right. So, so there's a couple of issues with that. One is there's no Android version. Texture had an Android version. That's going to be going away. Because Apple. And then two, when you want to send a link to somebody, it sends a link back to Apple News, which means it's, you know, it's stuck inside Apple because Apple and so I'm not as happy with that as I was with texture. Uh, I did it for that reason exactly. I get I have all the guilt one associates with getting paper magazines delivered to the door and then and then not reading them. I killed a tree for nothing. I have the yeah, New York Times, the Sunday Times, sitting in the footwell of my car. I you know it's fifty fifty. It'll ever get opened and read because it's all online now, right? Exactly, it's all online, and then it seems like when you're reading a magazine, you're reading, you know, last month's news, right? Yeah. <laughs> like things change. Yeah, magazines aren't... <laughs> so, yeah, I really wish the magazines would do... Well, this is an interesting challenge. So some magazines, like The Atlantic and The New Yorker, those are... Uh, New Yorker's Condé Nast, Atlantic is its own company, uh, have online apps, you know, the New Yorker app on iOS and Android, for instance. You can subscribe, or if you're a paper magazine subscriber, you can get into it. They also have a web presence where you can read a limited number of articles. I'm not a big fan of paywalls, and I think the idea of texture and News Plus now is... Well, nobody wants to have 20 subscriptions all, you know, hither and thither, even if it's only five or 10 bucks a year, because it's just a pain in the butt. We're, we're overwhelmed with subscriptions. So there That's is right. this thought that, well, if we aggregate it and give you one subscription for everything, that that's going to be more palatable to consumers. That's the idea behind Hulu, too. I, I'm, I have mixed feelings about this because it's getting to be back to the it's kind of back to the cable bundle. You know, mm -hmm. one of the things we didn't like about cable bundles is we had to buy a lot of stuff we didn't want to watch just to get the stuff we did. It's kind of what we're getting now, too. So, well, and I thought that way about texture. I mean, I liked it, you know, because like I said I thought it was cheap for seven ninety nine, and you know, it, it was nice to have. But I also found myself because I still had some print magazines being delivered to my house, still turning to those. Yes, right? just to be able to walk away There's from the screen. Yes, the yeah, get away from the screen. I don't know what right. the future holds for this, but I don't. I not, I'm not, I, I'm with you kind of. Now, maybe we're because we're old school. You know, the kids today, they don't care about magazines. They don't care about subscriptions. They don't, they don't even care about websites. If it ain't on YouTube, it doesn't exist. So I don't know what the world holds, to be honest. Our car guy coming up, I know that. Yeah, it's an interesting, it's a great question because uh, we're in the middle of kind of this vast sea change for everything, for publishers of all kinds, right? Hey, Leo, can I ask you one more question? Sure. A little bit? Well, sure. Hey, I'm about, to, I'm about to go on a cruise to Cuba, and I'm, I'm <gasps> going to be here a couple of days. So jealous. Um, <sighs> so any any thoughts about Internet access? I mean, is my Project Phi going to work? No. Um, Cuba, uh, unless things have changed, I haven't been to Cuba in a while. Yeah, I'd like a... Um, Um, 
the, the, because of the government, they very tightly control the internet. Uh, you you might get in a port. Yeah, I don't think you, you Google Fi will work, but you can check. Um, I think that the ship's internet might be the best you can get. They're getting that not from land sources, but from the satellites. So they those they're, they're not dependent on the Cuban government. But the last I heard, last time I had a friend in Cuba, he said the way people get internet content in Cuba is via a USB key you subscribe to, and then the guy comes around at your door and gives you this, and on that's all your internet, on your internet content. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, the only time I'm in Cuba, and like, we're going to be in Havana, is you know when we get off the ship, right? Yeah, the so ship will have internet. Although, or, as you know, internet. What which cruise line are you on? It's it's Royal Caribbean. Okay, well that's good because RCL has. I don't know if you'll have the Voom service on your ship. Yeah, it'll be one of the smaller ones. Yeah, but okay. that new internet service. I tried it on Anthem of the Seas, and I, it's like you're at home, even though there were five thousand people on the boat all presumably using the internet, but they have a very nice new uh, marine satellite system uh, that works, I think, remarkably well. So RCL yeah. should have and good I, internet for you. I've listened. You know, I'm an IT professional. I mean, I, I'm an independent consultant. And I thought, I've listened to you talking about, you know, Royal Caribbean's uh, internet access. Now, one thing I like about cruising is I try to get away from technology. Well, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> but you still have to do well, e like, email. You kind of want to be in touch with the right. whole. Yeah. But I thought, hey, maybe in the future I can work from the ship if I really want to. You know, the, you know, you know. I'm thinking, could I do my show from a ship? <laughs> you know, I'm thinking that. Right. That's why I was really interested That's to awesome. see Voom. So I'm glad you're liking Voom because I think, well, maybe if I wanted to take a, I got a big project on my hand, but I wanted to take a cruise. You know, I could compromise. You know, say, hey, I'll work some on the ship. You know, yeah. Uh, but, but I'm going on this trip. So. Cuba is not a Google Fi uh, country, and I'm not surprised uh, to hear that because that, it's relying on T-Mobile. So I'm not at all surprised. Yeah, we're only there for a short time, a couple of days. Yeah, so you know, get out, see it. the 50s cars, have some great food, enjoy some music, that kind of I, thing. I, I guess the, yeah, I guess the best thing about having the Pixel phone, see, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, carry around a heavy camera. No, you know, I love that Pixel phone for just the photography. Oh, I agree with you, and and it's getting better and better. I mean, they they have not they have not rested on their laurels. They're continuing because it's all software, so they're continuing to approve right. it. It's really impressive. So, I mean, yeah, very excited. So. Yeah. Oh, you're. I, I'm jealous because we had a trip to Cuba scheduled last year, and I canceled it after uh, the president uh, reinstated the sanctions. I thought I don't think this is a good time to to go but i think it's settled down now and so it's probably i i'm very jealous for a photographer there is it is one of the best places in the world i think just gorgeous. and uh, you know with all the unrest in venezuela it's like you better go now because you're right they're probably gonna put more restrictions yeah on. yeah yeah good point uh, i didn't even think of that there's a you know geez we're going to the middle east so. in the fall oh that'll be good <laughs> <laughs> safe there right right oh man it's you know I think it's a good time to see the world as quickly as you can. Cause, well, well cause, I'm just a few years younger than you, but so you know it's later in life I discovered cruising. I, I love I it. Your enthusiasm for cruising. I, oh my god! I just love it, and I'm. I'm I do. You're gonna have a wonderful time. I'm very jealous. Enjoy Havana, man. Old Havana, what fun! Yeah, I'm. I'm looking forward to it. Especially I, I always think that, you know when I see pictures of it, I think, well, it just looks like the land that time forgot. It is. Like stuck in the 50s. It is. So That's what's, it yeah. Before, before, that, was, that was exactly my exactly this phrase I said. I want to see it before it changes. Hey, i got to run. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Take thank care. you. Man. I appreciate bye, it. Bye-bye, Johnny. Bye, you too. Bye-bye. That music means but one thing. Sam Abul Samad, the car guy, principal researcher at Navigant Research. He's my car hero. Sam, we we bought we bought the kid's car. Well, it's, the, it's our car until the kid leaves What'd you the, get? the house. With 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 your good advice, Lisa shopped around. She was going to buy what they call an ICE vehicle, an internal combustion engine. You know, a gas car. Yeah, and made me sad. Well, it could be others. It could run on other stuff too besides I, gas. I had I had a little tear, a little tear, because you <laughs> know I I like elect my electric car. She ended up buying a Chevy Bolt. Oh, excellent! We Very love good it. Choice. Yeah, wow, well, is it great. A great car. The funny thing is the, the charger it comes with is one for a 128 wall, you know, just a regular plug. Like you can plug it in. Right, yeah. All, all, all EVs will come with one of those so you can plug it in anywhere. But it charges. Um, yeah. It goes like 10, mi you know, additional 10 miles every five hours. It's really slow. 
Yeah, well, you you if in that case you would definitely want to if you don't already have uh, a two forty volt uh, charger, uh, you know you can pick one of those up um, for about four hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe I'm cray cray. I hope I'm not cray cray. You know, we have the big dryer plug, right? The, the NEMA fourteen fifty. NEMA fourteen fifty. Yep. You see it behind your electric dryer. It's two hundred forty yep. volts. We had an electrician come out and install it. That's what I've been using to charge my Tesla. And it's a lot right. faster because it's fifty amps or something. It's a lot more, a uh, lot more yeah, wattage. Yeah, and, and you can you can buy. Um, I got an adapter, um, but am I crazy? I got a no, thing. No, no, you can you can buy like from Lowe's or Home Depot. There's a few different brands that you can get that uh, will plug right into that <clears throat> that uh, two forty volt chargers. It'll plug right into that NEMA fourteen fifty connector, um, and give you charging at at uh, up to seven point two kilowatts. So it'll be a lot faster. So you know you, you can. It, it, so it'll, it'll I, like the, the one I got, time. maybe you're, maybe you tell me if I'm crazy. I got it from a, a site that specializes in selling EV adapters, mm -hmm. and uh, it plugs into the NEMA fourteen fifty, the big dryer thing, and then has a little old fashioned whatever that is, the NEMA twenty six, the plug socket. And I and I, so I was thinking I could plug the thing that came with the bolt into that. Am I going to cause a fire? Uh, no, but the, the cable that comes with the car is, on, will only do, um, the, you know, it'll only draw at 110, oh, um, volts. Oh, so I need so, to get a better one. Yeah. So you need to get a, a four, um, a 240 volt charger, uh, okay. wall so charger. So I'm going to spend the 400 bucks then. There's no way around yeah, that. Yeah. But that, I mean, that's, that's something you only have to do once, you know, then for, for your next year. Then I'm set and, forever. Know, after that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it does it's a one time investment. come with one thing that we've talked about before, which is the new fast charging system, CCS mm -hmm. uh, charging, uh, because I know they're going to be superchargers, tes not Tesla superchargers, but supercharger style charging from uh, Audi on Electrify America all over the country. Right. And, you, and you've, you've actually already got some, you've got a couple of different locations in town in Petaluma there. There's one over at the, uh, uh, that outlet mall. Uh, it's just a few minutes away. There's a, an EV go station there, and there's another oh. one um, just on the, okay. on the north side. Of town so we don't as well. have to charge at home. We just drive across the street. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can definitely do that. Okay. Do you have a brand that you recommend? I'm looking at something from Max 16 electric vehicle charger. Does that uh, sound right? It looks like it's got a lot of stuff. It's not familiar with that okay. one. Okay. Um, what brand there's, do you there's like? a few different ones. Okay. Um, you want? Uh, I want a level Charge two. Charge One actually sells some home home charging units oh, now. Okay. There's there's a couple of other different ones as well. I'm looking at a uh, level two adapter, right? Isn't that what I'm looking yeah. for? Yeah. 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 Level level two means uh, four four or two forty volt charging. Okay. Um, and there's there's a number of different brands out there. Okay. Um, and if I can type the word charger in here, <laughs> then, uh, Siemens Siemens makes one. Um, there's there's and there's a few other brands okay. as well. Okay. Thank you. I didn't mean to take over your segment uh, for oh, personal no advice, worries. but you know, I think people no, I mean, when they look at electric, that's useful to the audience. Yeah, as when well. they look at electric cars, this is something that comes up. It's like this concern about, well, okay, I'm not going to be going to the gas station. Where do I fill it up? Yeah, no, absolutely, and that's that's the beauty of EVs is you can actually do it at home, um, you know, at, at various speeds, obviously. But there's there's uh, you know, it, it's not that difficult, you know, and it's a one time installation. So you know, if you're going to buy an EV. You might as well invest in having a uh, a charger installed, have, getting a wall charger. Uh, if you've already got, you know, a dryer was, plug, a I, two forty volt. I was plug, glad we didn't plug. fall for the Tesla because you can buy this expensive Tesla wall thing, but it turns out that NEMA fourteen fifty, which is ch fairly cheap to get, my electrician put it in. We had enough amperage on the on the box. Um, it works great. Charges nice and fast. I didn't need anything. But yeah, well, Tes fancy. Tesla actually sells one that's actually an even higher amperage one than oh. the fourteen fifty. So okay. that's probably what they were offering you. I see. But you know, if you're, you know, if you, depending on you know what your daily commute is, you know, unless your unless your commute is a hundred miles each way, yeah, no, you're been... you're probably going to be fine with the standard fourteen fifty. So you don't, as I remember, want to like rapidly charge unless you have to. It's hard yeah, on the it's, battery, it's, right? Yeah, it's definitely better to, you know, slower charging is definitely better, um, you know, for the battery's uh, durability. But um, as long as you're not, you know, for occasional fast charges and most manufacturers, most uh, car makers are pretty good about how they manage the, the battery charging, you know, making sure that as it starts to get full, it ramps down. We talked about this last week with the e-tron. Right. Um, yeah. Right. And also, you know, making sure the battery is cooled properly so that it doesn't over, overheat. Now, I can't help but notice that behind you is an Amazon delivery robot. 
It's actually not an Amazon robot. This is one that we saw uh, this week. I was in Los Angeles. Ford held their uh, their second uh, City of Tomorrow symposium oh, in Los Ford. Angeles this week. Oh. Yeah, and they're they're the Ford Research is uh, partnering with a company called Agility Robotics, and like Amazon. And we earlier this year we talked about FedEx and their their FedEx robot. I think um, you know what they're trying to do is figure out the the last fifty foot problem when it comes to autonomous vehicles. You know, so the autonomous vehicle can come up, pull up to your curb, even pull up into your driveway if you have one, you know, and deliver stuff for you. But how do you get whatever you're getting from the, the vehicle to your porch or to your mailbox, you know, or, you know, to the trunk of your car if you're having it delivered that way, as we talked about. Um, and so many uh, companies are looking at a bunch of different solutions. You know, Amazon's, you know, working on drones. That's one possibility. Um, you know, and what Ford showed with uh, with Agility Robotics is this bipedal uh, robot that, uh, you know, has a couple of rubber-tipped hands. Uh, and instead of a head, it's got a LiDAR sensor uh, where, where the head would be. Uh, and, you know, it emerges from the vehicle, picks up the package, and walks over to your... Uh, to your porch and so drops the packet. If What's I saw there? this, I would be terrified. Why do they make it so tall, for instance? Well, it's, it's actually not that tall. It it's looks as tall about, as a uh, human. Uh, no, it's actually only about uh, four and a half, five feet tall. So it's it's not actually that big. Um, that The van that it's the, in the picture there is actually a Ford Transit Connect, which is a, a compact van. Um, you know, and I talked to uh, Craig Stevens, the director of controls and automated systems at Ford Research, uh, about why they chose a bipedal robot. And he said, "Well, you know, they're they're trying to come up with something can go that can up steps. In a, it, well, yeah, they're trying they're trying to design something that works in a world designed for humans who happen to be bipedal. You know, we have two legs. <laughs> yeah, most of us anyway. Yeah. But still, uh, this looks like the Terminator's delivering your box." Yeah, it it, it kind of does. Uh, you know, and this is really only the the beginning. Does it go know, at this point. <laughs> Here it is, citizen. Yeah, Here is your delivery. I would be terrified. Yeah, this this is a very early research this project. This is a dystopian but, but, future. I am not looking forward to saying. Abul Salid yeah. is our car guy. We love him. Principal researcher at Navigant Research, and as you can see, he is my personal car guy as well. I apologize, Sam, but thank you for the uh, tips. And and you know, you had recommended the Kira, the Kia Nero, uh, but you. But I think, as I remember, you like the Bolt as well. And Yep. We're, we're happy. Nice range and uh, a fun car to drive. Thank you, Sam. No problem. Leo happy Laporte, to be here, Leo. the tech guy. More calls coming up. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Low, da, rally, lower. <laughs> uh, 8888 Ask Leo is the phone number. I, I, I ran out of time, but I would have loved to talk with Sam about the latest tesla news consumer reports and by the way they've had a, a checkered history with tesla first recommending tesla's best car they'd ever tested then saying now we can't recommend it because it's dangerous they they don't really like the autopilot stuff um there's a new feature on uh, tesla's autopilot software i think it's only on the latest hardware uh versions of the tesla but it uh, it lets drivers choose whether the car will change lanes automatically. Now, I have uh, an autopilot feature on my uh, older Tesla, almost three years old now, that when I'm on autopilot, if I, if I hit the turn signal, the car will change lanes. And it's supposed to have sensors to watch and make sure it's not plowing into somebody. My experience has been, in general, that it's pretty good, but pretty good when you're changing lanes in the freeway is not good enough. So when I use that feature, I always look and then say, okay, change lanes. Because I've I, the Teslas seemed to want to change lanes into a car in the past. So, Well, now this new feature is an auto lane change. And it's part of Tesla kind of trying to give the car full autonomy. The ability to, you know, you say, I want to go home and drive all the way home. In order to do that, it might need to be able to change lanes automatically. Consumer Reports says, hmm, in practice, we found the new Navigate on Autopilot lane-changing feature lagged far behind a human driver's skills. Not as good as a human. The feature cut off cars without leaving enough space and even passed other cars in ways that violate state laws. 
As a result, the driver often had to prevent the system from making poor decisions. Consumer Reports uh, Director of Auto Testing, Jake Fisher, said, quote, the system's role should be to help the driver, but the way this technology is deployed, it's the other way around. So I guess I won't be turning that on. My, ex my recommendation, my experience with Tesla's autopilot is it does help me be a better driver. But it doesn't mean I don't have to be the driver. You know, you turn it just like, you know, in many cars have lane uh, keeping assist. They have, uh, you know, adaptive cruise control. Uh, cars nowadays will also often uh, do emergency braking if there's a sudden stop in front of them. All of these things are good as long as you don't assume you don't have to drive. We still have to keep our eyes on the road and our hands on the wheel. There's no way around it. No way around it. And I thought, hmm. David Freeman, vice president of advocacy at Consumer Reports, says Tesla is showing what not to do, what not to do on the path towards self-driving cars. Release increasingly automated driving systems that aren't vetted properly. 8888, ask Leo. On we go with the show. Dr. Mom! Are you, you're back in hey, Long Leo. Island? You're, you, you're not in San Diego. Just spent two weeks in San Diego. I'm back here packing more boxes. Then talking about Teslas, next week I am driving the fur babies across country in the Tesla. You're going to stop along the way, and the Tesla helps you with this, uh, using superchargers along the way, I presume. Right, and if you notice, they started pushing uh, up higher charging speeds. Oh. 150 amps. Oh, interesting. Not all... Not at all. And the other thing that just rolled out, unless your supercharger is a waypoint on a destination, they're going to start limiting you to 80% of a full charge in the car. Yeah. To free up the chargers. Because I, I don't know about you, but I've seen, it's not unusual to see lines at uh, superchargers. Oh. oh, yeah. No question yeah. about it. And yeah. they go, supposedly it's going to precondition the battery. So the battery's ready to be charged just, as soon as we get there. I, I know you're coming. So good luck with your cross-country drive. I'd love to hear how that goes. Well, keep an eye. Well, you don't do, on Facebook, but keep an eye on the Twitter feed, and you may see like smoke coming out of my ears. <laughs> How many furry uh, things do you have in that car? I have my terrier and our cat, and a friend of mine who does a lot of cross country trips. She has a service a dachshund, so we will have two dogs and a cat in the car. And unfortunately, you can't. I don't think they're going to be saying he's breathing on me. She's touching me, but I may be hearing fights in the back. <laughs> Mom. Don't make me put this Tesla over. Do not make me pull this Tesla over. Mom! He stole my bone. I can't imagine the cat doing so well. Well, the cat actually doesn't mind car trips. I put a thunder oh. shirt on him. Oh, one of those special really binding thing. things. I didn't know cats liked those, too. Oh, they do. And then there's a, like a calming spray you put on it. And then he goes in a carrier where it's almost like calming a cave and he just spray. goes to sleep. A.K.A. Prozac. So, uh, <laughs> that's for me. <laughs> Mom needs that one. So, you called because uh, you're our uh, Amazon Echo expert, and there's a new feature on the Echo that listens for glass breaking. And people, what is that? And that's gone live, right? Don't say the A word, but that they call it A word, A word guard, right? That's correct. They announced it in, a couple of months ago. I called in then, it went live both in my new house in San Diego and. The one in New York. It doesn't replace a burglar alarm, but I think it's kind of nice to know. It's interesting. There is a certain creep factor because it widens what the machine listens to. Oh, yeah. To. It's now listening for the sounds of breaking glass and for the sounds of smoke and CO detectors going off. And I did test it. I had an old piece of broken glass, put it, <laughs> got a box, put something on the bottom so when it shattered, it wouldn't go all over the place, dropped it, yeah. put the guard on, and it did say, I heard glass breaking. Oh, That's nice. Warning that it's Nice. And I pushed the test button. Wait a minute, though. Wait a minute. Detectors. Wait a minute. So it's <laughs> so you're not home. Burglar breaks in, and the echo tells the burglar, "I heard glass breaking." No, you hear. Um, you get it on your phone. You oh, your phone back. says, "I hear glass breaking too." Also, if you have one of two security companies, ADT or Ring of Security, yeah, you can link it to that, and that'll get a notification to them also. I feel like Amazon is moving quickly into this market. I'm just waiting for there to be an Amazon um, security company. Yeah, 
I feel like that's where they're headed. Of course, but, uh, honestly, where they're headed is an Amazon everything company. Of course, yeah. except they still haven't got Amazon Auto out. I personally, I think that may be vaporware. I have seen nobody who's got that thing. No. As a physician, are you uh, encouraged by Amazon's possibly getting into health insurance? Well, um, I don't know what's going to happen with health insurance. I don't want to get into politics on this show. Um, I think eventually we're going to have to go to some kind of a single pl payer plan, but that may be for this country 20 years away. I think it's it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be, a, in my opinion, it's going to be a slow adoption. Yeah. Because of the, because and obviously the Amazon doesn't think that, otherwise they wouldn't be moving to get into health insurance, right? Because there's... But, right. But the one thing they did, remember, they signed the HIPAA small business agreement, which lets them, you let you use the device to communicate with your doctor and it's end-to-end -end encrypted, and Amazon's oh. not listening in on those conversations. Oh, I, I do like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Somebody's saying the wise cams, and I guess I heard this too. Scooter X in our chat room says the wise cams also can hear uh, smoke alarm signals. I don't know if they do glass break, but those are the $20 cameras we really like. Right, so, but I don't know if the wise cams are going to connect with alarm companies. And I'm willing to bet oh, yeah. more alarm companies besides those two are going to start yeah. working together. Because, I mean... The house I'm in now, we have glass break detectors. It's going to be a pleasure not to have these things stuck all over the yeah. ceiling. Dr. Mom, safe Bye. trip with your dachshund, your kitty cat, and your terrier <laughs> in the car across the country. Good luck. I hope that spray works. You might spray it on yourself, too. A little calming. I need a little calm. Mommy's calming spray. Where's Mommy's calming spray? Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Oh, yeah, it's that time of day. The Tech Guy Show. Yeah, we're on. This is where we talk. But this is kind of where all the uh, all the tech enthusiasts gather to talk tech. Kind of a computer user group of the airwaves. And tech can be a lot of things these days. You know, when I first started doing this show back in the early 90s. Yes, the early 90s. Uh, it was pretty much PCs. If you were really cray-cray uh, and, uh, and liberal, you might talk about Macs which I did because I loved the Mac from the day it came out in 1984. You didn't really, there was no internet to speak of. Nobody was using it except in universities. So in the early 90s, that's it. <laughs> a lot of stuff like, I got an interrupt request conflict. IRC, IRQ conflict. I can't print with the parallel port. That kind of stuff. Now it's everything because tech's in everything from your car to your microwave to your home theater, your phone, of course, you carry a supercomputer in your pocket. Something, you know, in the early 90s, we would have just gone, oh. I remember <laughs> in 94, I think, uh, Micron came out with, oh, this was so exciting, a new Pentium-based Windows machine that was operating at 90 megahertz. And I thought, I remember playing with it thinking, this is so fast. I feel slippery. Whoa, I can't keep up. <laughs> Single core, 90 megahertz. That was state of the art. Today, Intel announced their latest uh, i9 processor. It has, well, no, I can't remember if it's four or eight cores. I think it's eight cores. And they're running not at 90 megahertz, but at 5,000 megahertz, 5 gigahertz, times 8 cores. Yes, yeah, 8 cores <laughs> compared to 90 megahertz at 1 core. That's, um, and the computer in your, in your pocket is running at multiples of gigahertz, usually around 2 gigahertz. <clears throat> which is, again, 2,000 megahertz. Compare that to 90. <laughs> Memories faster and much more plentiful. We were, oh, back then we were happy if you had, you know, a couple of megabytes, megabytes of RAM. I remember going to a computer store, guy saying, all you'd ever need is eight megabytes of RAM. You got two for your computer, your operating system, <laughs> two for the program, megabytes, not gigabytes, megabytes, two for the program, and two for your RAM disk. Remember RAM disks? <laughs> and I can't remember what the other two was. <laughs> this guy was speaking very authoritatively at the time. <laughs> and he probably wasn't too, too wrong. I just read a story 
in computer world. Uh, computer world now has been around for a long time, since 1967. It's still around, which is kind of neat. Uh, the, you know, that, that's, I think, got to be the longest running um, computer magazine of all. 50 years, right? 50 plus. In 1967, when Computer World started publishing a megabyte, and again, I'm, I'm emphasizing the M here, not, not gigabyte, not terabyte, megabyte, smaller than a floppy, megabyte hard drive would, would cost $1 million. $1 million a megabyte. Today, a megabyte on a hard drive, about two cents. Actually, that's that's actually pretty high. Um, we're seeing uh, spinning hard drives down at a nickel, a gigabyte. A gigabyte. And uh, even SSDs are down below 10 cents. A gigabyte. <laughs> so, yeah, things have changed a little bit since I started doing <laughs> I started doing this, but I uh, I love talking about it, and I just love all the different ways we can use technology today. And I'd love to talk to you about it. Eighty eight eighty eight, ask Leo's the phone number eight 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 two seven five five three six. The website, and I'll say it again, is free and open, and no no limits, no bars. You don't have to pay for it or anything. You don't have to sign up for anything. Just go to techguylabs dot com. We even put audio and video of past shows up there. Now, my shows, I don't have recordings going back to 1992. I wish I did. I, You know, but I don't. Uh, they only go back to 2004. <laughs> 15 years. Uh, 1,595 episodes are up there. So enjoy those. And if you want to take a trip back. I always like reading old computer magazines because it's kind of fun to see how far we've come in, such a sh in really such a short time. Greg is on the line from San Clemente, California. Hey, Greg, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. Good to talk to you this afternoon. Thanks for calling. Uh, I have kind of an interesting uh, application for technology I'm trying to work out. I, I'm the, I run the uh, USA surfing program for the Olympics. Oh, so that's cool. To Tokyo in 2020 for the first year for surfing. How are they going to do that in Tokyo? Well, it's going to be at Shiragasaki Beach, which is in Chiba on the eastern coast. And Got the it. surf is very similar to the east coast of the United States that time of year. So there'll be waves. Um, but, uh, <laughs> there'll be waves. <laughs> there won't be big waves. <laughs> no, probably could be, though, if we get a typhoon. But we, get, we have a 16-day waiting period the entire uh, 16 days of the Olympics. Oh, interesting. Out. Three days of competition. I'm so. thrilled to hear that surfing is, is part of the Olympics now. That's great. Yeah, it'll be fun. We got added with uh, skateboarding and climbing. Um, wow. Which, which climbing would be fun to watch. Yeah, no, it's super interesting. Is it free climbing? Uh, no, it's not. And there's, you know, there's the purists that like to do the free climbing, but it's it's kind of like the uh, the gym wall type climbing. Oh, yeah, you got belays, uh, so you got a safety rope. And yeah climbing and that kind of thing. Oh, what I would love to watch that. That'll be fun. And of course, yeah. surfing is fun to watch. I love that. Yeah. So, um, anyways, I, I have a tech background. I was in uh, high tech media sales for thirty years, and I think I'm like the Forrest Gump of uh, high tech. <laughs> some of the stuff that I. I so media for. thirty years ago, high tech media sales meant magazines, right? I mean, that was it. Exactly yeah. right, and, and through into the internet stuff, but. Um, so I've, I've known what technology can do. I know enough about it to be dangerous and, and know how to get projects done and stuff. So a lot of what I've been doing with surfing is trying to bring it into the 21st century where 15 years ago they were using actually a, a program that was developed by K-Pro as a special application for, for judging surf contests. K-Pro. Wow. Literally back in the early 80s. It would have been a it would have been a DOS program. Wow. Yes. Yeah. And then, then they brought it over to DOS, and um, the last version of it, I was watching the boot up on the screen, and it was a bootleg Portuguese version of 1997 DOS. So um, <laughs> nobody had done anything with it for a lot of years, and, and we couldn't find laptops that it would run on anymore. And um, so, so anyways, we went to work and. Um, developed a computer scoring program uh, that works off of, uh, you know, little notebooks. And, uh, you know, we have a local uh, Wi-Fi network and a cellular um, 
cellular data link, so it, it updates to an app, so everyone on the beach that has the app can see the scores in real time and and follow the action and what have you. And, and we have other things like uh, there, there's a priority system where it's essentially a system for taking turns, uh, catching the waves, uh, it tracks that, and then we have instant replay uh, for the judges so they can rewatch a wave on video, and then all those waves are tagged and they go into the app. So the surfers can, after after the event, watch their waves and compare their waves to others. Oh, wow. Surfers. That's amazing. Have you. So it's, it's pretty cool. But the one issue that we run into is uh, we have a live announcer on the beach that's announcing scores to the surfers out in the water, Ooh. and it's critical information. What are the surfers to... wearing? Are they wearing headphones? No, no, it's just the PA system. Oh, it's so, just really loud. Yeah, and, <laughs> and we've, we've looked at getting directional stuff that the Coast Guard uses, and they recommended against it because if anyone was in you know, too close. It could You'd hurt them. Yeah. 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 And so with the, the onshore winds and, and loud surf, um, you can't, a lot of times you can't hear the scores. So what we've been looking at doing is taking this application that we developed and getting it to work on the iWatch. Oh, yeah. And, now, they're not uh, completely waterproof. I, I, I mean, you can wear them surfing. Wondering. Yeah. You can wear them surfing. There are more waterproof solutions out there. Uh, Apple, so here's the deal. Apple says you can wear it swimming, right. but then if you uh, if it breaks and you bring it in, they say, "Oh no, but we don't. <laughs> yeah, it's void. We don't. It's yeah, salt water we don't certify it. it for that. Yeah, salt's very corrosive. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm gonna. I'm gonna let me do some uh, some research because I don't know. Uh, but I would. Well, I, I would think there'd be some waterproof watches. There's, there is, and there's um, a company called Rip Curl has a GPS watch, which will track your distance you cover while you're surfing and your speed and things like that. And then uh, Boy, know, the, I know the tech of surfing is amazing. I suddenly become very high tech. You come a long way from the K Pro. Yes, exactly. But um, so my questions are: if we if we were to find a watch that would be suitable, uh, do we do we um, rely on cellular data which could be spotty and then there's some latency from from our system uh you know yeah but that's going to be your best bet because uh i guess you could use directional how far out do the surfers go from maybe up to 300 feet away from okay. from the shore you could you could have a wi-fi access point that would have enough juice to More get 300 feet one. Yeah. yeah you could do that Okay. And so and so are, that's two things now you need. You need a Wi Fi a watch that does Wi Fi and is waterproof. Right. Um a lot you know, and I mean the the Apple Watch is Wi Fi. Um the, most of the uh Android Wear watches are Wi Fi. So you should be able to find that. And yeah, you just need a very powerful access point. You know, I bet okay. you something like the G Shock, this the Casios. Right. Those are very durable, right? Right. The question is if you can get data out to them. Yeah, and I'm worried about like porting, you know, the data. So, so this app that we developed, the developer is like, oh, you know, well, how do we know it's going to work on the on the iWatch, and I have to pay a lot more money. Well, and also it's kind of a mission critical environment. If one surfer can't get it, he's at a disadvantage, right? right? Exactly. Let me keep uh, doing some research for you. I think Wi-Fi okay. would be more reliable, but you got to have a watch that can support it. Right. Um, or maybe it doesn't have to be a watch. Maybe there's some other thing they could do, like a... I don't know. I don't know. That's a really interesting uh, open question. Open to any suggestions, yeah. Chat room uh, saying the tick watch from uh, Mobovi, Mo Mobvoi. Okay. Um, I don't know if it'll do, that's just, that's TickWatch E2. It's five atmospheres. Wow, that's pretty good. It's very waterproof. Yeah. Um, it is a Android Wear watch, which means it would do the Wi-Fi stuff. And it uh, doesn't look too expensive either. It's definitely, that looks like one that's really designed for. Okay, I'll check that out. Yeah. And we'd have to test it because obviously when they're paddling, their, wa their arms are going you know, foot and a half under the water. Jeez. And so would you lose the Wi-Fi connection and then it have to, like, reconnect and would there be issues? No, I think, I think Wear OS would handle that pretty well.
Okay. So this is good. This has a heart rate sensor, built-in GPS, um, and it's swim-proof at five atmospheres. Is that what ATM means? I think so. So that's pretty good. Yeah. No, that's that pretty darn good. I can totally do the trick. Yeah. Yeah, take a look. $159 bucks list. Yeah, that's cheaper than I want. Good luck to the U.S. team in the Olympics. That's exciting. All right. I appreciate that. Thanks. Thanks yeah, for the call. Uh, tune in and watch. Thanks, Leo. I will. I will. That is, that is That's going to give me a little something to... Some attachment to the uh, to the games next year. 8888 Ask Leo, the phone number. If you have a suggestion, you want to help our U.S. Olympic surf team, call or ask your question to Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More of your calls coming up in just a little bit. Chris Marquardt says we're going to do our photo assignment in about 10 minutes. So if you submitted a, a picture for building, stay tuned. 8888 Ask Leo, Leo Laporte, the tech guy, especially if you have a if you're a swimmer or a surfer and you have a watch recommendation, I know Nixon uh, is the brand for surfers. I used to wear a lot of Nixons, but I don't think they have a smart watch, or do they? Maybe they do. I kind of feel bad because Android Wear, which is, I think, a fairly good smart operating system. Oh, they do. There is the Nixon Mission, which is an Android Wear smart watch. I think Android Wear is pretty good, but I think it gets short shrift because Google just seems to not really care about it. And it's, uh, you know, it's a Google operating system. I, uh, because I mostly carry a Samsung Galaxy S10 Plus as my day-to-day -day phone, I wear a Samsung smartwatch, which I quite like, but they're not as, they're not as sophisticated as um, uh, the Android Wear stuff, software-wise. Beats DOS, though. Beats the K-Pro. Todd in Los Angeles, you're next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Todd. Hi. Um, I just want to make sure you can hear me. I hear you great. Oh, great. Thank you. Two questions. One, a couple of shows back, you recommended a dash cam. You, you talked about the Garvin, but there was one that you said you liked better, and I didn't have a chance to jot it down because, you know, I wasn't yeah. ready. Can you, do you remember? <laughs> yeah, sure, I, I do. Um, the Garmin is, I think, the one recommended by the wire cutter, and I always, I really do trust the wire cutter. I think they're great. The one I use, though, has some additional features that make it more expensive, so it's something you should be aware of. It's called the Owl Cam, O-W-L, like hoo-hoo, hoo-hoo. Okay. Owlcam.com. And uh, I use it, and I love it. It has a front-facing and rear-facing camera. It's expensive, yeah. 350 bucks, but with it, it gets you get a year of LTE service. And one of the reasons I like that is it will phone home if your car's broken into. Uh, if you get in an accident, even if you don't remember to say the trigger word to, to save that, it will send those images up to the OWL server. So even if your car bursts into flames, there would be... The video of the accident would be stored on the OWL servers. I also like it because it powers itself using the OBD2 port, which is right under your steering wheel. And that means it's powered all the time, not just when your car is on. You can also very nicely hide the wiring so it looks like it's installed. I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. It's, uh, it is it is a, um, a high-def camera. Actually, it's more than high-def the the uh, view out front is 4K, 1440p. The view inside the uh, the car is 720p. Great camera too for people who maybe have teenagers because you can actually turn on the camera and see who's driving <laughs> and see what they're doing uh, and even talk to them. So uh, I'm I'm a very happy Owl Cam user, but it is a lot more expensive than the Garmin. So something to keep in mind. It's time for our photo guy, Chris Marquardt. He is the, the king of digital photography on our show anyway. He uh, leads some amazing workshops. In fact, Chris is going to, what is it, Kyrgyzstan? Oh, let me turn on your mic. That would help. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan next week, actually for a couple of weeks, so we'll miss you, Kurt, Chris. Um, but that is a photo workshop uh, people sign up for. Uh, why Kyrgyzstan? Is there, is there great scenery there? Oh, Kyrgyzstan is just, uh, it's part of the um, former Silk Road, so it has all these interesting settlements, it has amazing landscapes, there's like um, beautiful national parks, alpine views, snow peaks, rivers, um, architecture, it's like everything's there. They still have yurts there, so we'll spend a, oh, a night in a yurt. And oh, fun. Fall. 
all interesting stuff. What does a yeah. yurt smell like? Um, well, the, the, the insulation around is made from sheep's wool. Yeah, that's so what I thought. So there might be a <laughs> bit of a woolly smell Pungent. there. Pungent would no, be the word. I don't think it. No, I wouldn't think so. I think they wash it before they make the yurt out of it. I look at it and I think, eh, this looks like a place, <laughs> pungent place to stay. I've I been in a yurt before in uh, in Siberia and it was just lovely. It's fine. Warm. Nice and warm. It's warm nice anyway. And, warm. and I tell you, when you're out yes. in Siberia, anything warm probably feels great. <laughs> Chris's images are incredible, and his workshop's even better. Go to discoverthetopfloor.com to sign up. There's some great ones coming uh, for 2020 that I'm really dying to go on, including Cappadocia and Turkey, Bhutan, the uh, happiest place on earth, Ethiopia, and the Lake Baikal Big Ice Journey. <clears throat> yeah. Chris also has some great books, including uh, your latest, The Wide Angle Photography Book, which I love. And, uh, and in fact, I took my first picture in three weeks just now. Oh, you, you, I broke you my finished fast. your, well, you, I, I think I gave you two weeks, right? Yeah, actually, I, I, this isn't my first picture because I, <laughs> I took, I had to take it, apply for an exemption because my daughter graduated from college last Saturday. So I had to take a couple of pictures there, but that's it. Okay. Exemption and, granted. Yeah, so that's okay. <laughs> yeah, that one I had to, but, uh, yeah. And this is a 28 millimeter, uh, fixed lens and i really like it because it's great this is a great lens for like street photography for people photography get getting in there it's beautiful focal length yeah. i like 28 millimeters yeah it's, it's not distorted it's not curved it doesn't make people's noses too big <laughs> but you can really get into something you know if there's a group of people talking to each other you get right in there and i love the shot so you know 20, 28 millimeters is the same that most smartphone lenses yes, have. Yes, so. that's the other reason I like it because so very it's, a very familiar, familiar I angle of view. Yeah. Yes. So it's time for a review. Uh that by the way was my excuse for not submitting any pictures this week. <laughs> your your assignment was take a picture of a building, like a, an actual building. Yep, the building which which was handed in by an audience member which uh we are also going to, going to do for the next assignment, but I chose three images that we want to look at. And the first one is by the Thiam Tree, Thiam Tree, and it's one of those classical shots that you can do with a wide angle if you are in a city with big buildings around you. And that's the straight up shot into the sky, where the, the buildings come in from all sides. So. Um, I've taken shots like that in New York, in San Francisco, and in other places. And I always like this because it it does something interesting. Because, of course, everyone knows the buildings, but then it also does something interesting with uh, the space that is not a building, and that's the sky. You have this very clean backdrop with maybe a cloud or two in there. but uh, Or in this case, I think there's even a small airplane flying through the image. So you you get this... Uh, this this nice composition that's only the subjects, which are the buildings, and the negative space. That's what we call it, the space that is not the buildings. There's no distractions in there. So very clean shot. Works works best if it's taken really straight up, not just not at an angle, but really straight up. So this one uh, covers that, and I like it. Sometimes people are worried when they take pictures of buildings that it looks like the building's about to fall on you. Well, that, this is an extreme, right? This if, is, if you this, turn it, it makes all it the work. way up, then that's, yeah, that works. Yeah, yeah. that works just fine. Yeah. So it, it, embrace that, um, if, especially if you don't have a view camera hanging around so <laughs> that you true. can eliminate uh, that. This is great. It reminds me a little bit, there were some beautiful shots in Roma, that amazing black and white movie that should have won the Academy Award uh, this year um, by Alphonse uh, Cuaron. And he has some, and they're not, it's a movie, but he has some shots like this. And you'll see the planes moving over Mexico City. And it really is gorgeous. Really gorgeous. Beautiful. All right. Good good picture. Thank you, whatever your name is. I think, I feel like his name is Dimitri, but he's calling it Dimitri or something. Oh, possibly, know. yeah. I don't know. So the next one by Rick Reb, Iowa 80 Trucking Museum is the title of it. <laughs> I love it. I love and it. <laughs> it's one of those. It was. It's a black and white photo. We see a building, and it says Iowa 80 Trucking Museum. It's a simple shot of a, a kind of an Art Deco kind of style picture or building, um, and this is. I, that's a good example 
uh, for first of all, how pictures can tell stories, architecture can tell stories, because that is the, the the shapes and the fonts of something that is not current. So it kind of takes us back a bit. Uh, the black and white helps with that too. And it also is a good example of um, the, a picture that works by not showing what's going on around it. It's just the building. Uh, it shows some landscape to the left, and then I'm pretty sure there's the next building coming right on the left side, but it's not in the picture. So you get this feeling of like a wide open space, and especially to the left, that works really well. And then there's this one lonely little bench in the now, front. That's my favorite which, part of this picture, just that little bench. Which is what, which I come back to that all the time because it just sits there and... It's I don't know. It's, it's just, just this little thing. It has nice <laughs> nice contrast towards the black background. Yeah. So the other thing I think really is interesting is it is a black and white photo, but it's it's not literally black and white. There's some color toning in it. So he's using some sort of filter that preserves maybe a little bit of the red or something. So it's very a interesting. bit of a warm a bit of a warm yeah. tone in it. Yeah. yeah, which also is reminiscent of older photos with the sepia toning. Yeah, so that's sepia. a very similar effect. Yeah. But it's not sepia all the way. So I have a feeling that so, – I've seen filters like this where if there's a strong red in it, it will preserve some of that without sepia ah, toning maybe the entire that's it. picture. Yeah, I like it. I like it a lot. All right. And last but not least, Orlando Adrovet by – yeah, well, that's – is that the name of the person? I think it is. Yes, yes. Um, it because this is, is the very a, famous landmark. It's a picture of the bean. The, the bean. The bean. <laughs> the uh, I don't even know. I think it's the this sky gate or something. Um, no one in knows the real name. It's always I been think, the bean. I think it does have a real name, but it it's this sculpture, the reflective ski, steel sculpture that looks like a bean in Chicago, and I like it because it reflects buildings and it does that does the thing it does. It does it in a very interesting way. It, distorts everything and people normally use that sculpture to take fun selfies in it like uh, uh, strange strangely bent faces in them but um, this is of buildings and they get this interesting bend and it's also in the evening so uh, kind of a blue hour shot so you have a nice blue sky and the lights in the buildings have already come on and it's just, yeah, it's just fun I to look it. at. I, I, I like it. this. Yeah. And this is, it could almost have been a trite shot because it's such a well-known landmark. But I like the, sure. I like the, the, the light in it. It's just fantastic. Well, yeah, Chris, we only so, have 30 seconds left. Tell us our assignment for next time. And you won't be here for two weeks, so we have a few weeks to do this. Right. Next assignment, A, a B. Uh, we had Apple, we have buildings, now we go to C, and that's the close-up. And oh, uh, the, good. the tag for that, we use a new tag structure, prefix this with TG. So it's TG close-up to keep All things... All one word. TG findable. for tech guy, close-up, one word. Exactly. Submit it to Flickr, and in a month we'll talk. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 88, 88, ask Leo... That's the phone number. On we go with the show. Uh, I think it's, yeah, Grant in St. Paul, Minnesota. Hello, Grant. Hi, Leo. Welcome. Uh, so. Relax. Take, it, uh, take a load off. Have a seat. What can we talk? Let's talk about something to do with tech. What do you, what do you, what's on your mind? I have been uh, intrigued by these voice assistants. But I absolutely hate the idea of them talking to their servers off their Google or Amazon or whatever. But it would be a handy thing to have to like, control things around my house. They are. Uh, and it, it, so voice, which is, I would, I would offer the first totally new user interface since the keyboard and mouse. Um is good for some things, not all things. I think for a while people thought, oh, you'll be you'll be using voice for everything. You'll be, everybody in the office will be going, nah, 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 nah. that doesn't work. You don't actually tend not to use voice when there are other people around. But when you're driving or when you're at home, you want to turn on lights. I, I actually have a little routine, a bedtime routine that I'll say to my, uh, and it works, by the way, on a Google Assistant as well as on a, a Amazon Echo because many of the devices, in this case, it's Philips Hue lights. They, they work with both. 
Uh, but often what will happen is people will get in an ecosystem. So let me address your concern, which I think is very legitimate. You're putting a microphone in your house that is connected back to servers at App, Apple, Echo, uh, Amazon, or Google. And I guess you could. there is one speaker that connects back to Microsoft. So the, you could say, well, which one of these companies do I trust with my privacy? Um, you should understand that it doesn't send stuff back to the server until you trigger it. So in most cases, what it's doing is locally listening for the trigger word. As soon as it hears the trigger word, it matches it up with a waveform in, built into the machine. It then starts sending everything subsequent back to the servers where we know it is stored. And it does that, well, for at least one technical reason, which is the servers are doing the work. And then if there's a command, they send it back to the, the home automation base station or whatever it is it's communicating with. It would be lovely if it could do it locally. And more and more, we're seeing that. Uh, Apple has said for a long time that many of the uh, intelligent features on, on its smartphones are device only. Google this year, uh, a couple of weeks ago, at its developers conference showed more and more device only Google Assistant capabilities. Uh, and I think they understand that for, for a lot of people, having that voice recognition happen only on the device would be preferable. So that is, that is going to come. The, the problem is your phone is a $1,000 or thereabouts device. It's a very powerful computer, so it can, and it has a lot of storage, so it can do stuff like that. But an Amazon Echo or a Google Assistant is a cheap, low and slow device. It has slow processors, doesn't have a lot of storage. On device recognition for that would take uh, it would have to be a lot more expensive, and it would you know because it's got to have the computing power, the storage, to do it. So we're going to see this on the phone before we're going to see it in the home. You have to decide though um, if it's only going to send back to the home office stuff that happens after I say the keyword. Am I? I mean, it's not listening to every utterance you make, but you know, unfortunately, all of these devices can be false triggered. They can, they can falsely detect their keyword and will record whatever they hear after that. So there have been weird examples of these devices malfunctioning. There was a very famous case. Uh, a couple is arguing, and the Amazon Echo apparently heard its keyword in the argument. It wasn't intentional. Then, somehow... Something the couple was saying translated to the echo as send this con send this message to somebody in my contact list. Turned out the somebody in the contact list was a former employee of the of the of the man in the argument. And he was he received it and he was baffled. He said, Why did I get this recording of you two fighting? It made the news. And Google or I'm sorry, Amazon said, Well, yeah, this is the this is the sequence of events that would have had to happen. They would have even had to say, yes, send it, and, and, and the Echo would have had to heard it. So it, that is unlikely, but it does happen. So there is a privacy, a legitimate privacy concern that stuff you say could be inadvertently not only sent to Amazon, but to, uh, sent to somebody you know, which could really be devastating if it was the wrong thing. You know, perhaps my bigger concern, though, is I want control over what it does, not necessarily just privacy, like so you can, if you wish, it's going to take a little more effort on your part, but you can get on-device home automation stuff. And you can do it with a relatively inexpensive computer like the Raspberry Pi. So there is open source home automation software uh, that, that keeps the information to itself. The best known is OpenHab at O-P-E-N-H-A-B, as in Habitat, openhab.org. That is, that is uh, completely internal, doesn't go back to anybody else's server. You need to have a pretty decent machine to run it, but a Raspberry Pi will do it. That's a $35 computer. So a lot mm -hmm. of people use OpenHab on a Raspberry Pi. It does not go back to the cloud ever. Uh, it can integrate, if you want, with Google Assistant, Amazon's Echo, uh, Apple's HomeKit, even if this, then that. And it'd be my guess, although I'm not sure off the top of my head, that it can be taught voice control. I'm, I'm not sure 
but it, I, it would be almost useless if it couldn't. But even if it can't, what you'd have is an open hab app on your phone that you could then communicate with probably using, mm -hmm. using your phones. You know, on iOS, you could use probably use shortcuts to control it. On a Samsung device, Bixby could probably control it. So there are ways. It's just a lot more trouble. But if you're pri if you're concerned about privacy, that's in a nutshell <laughs> how you protect your privacy. A little more trouble, you know. It's good. it's on you to do the stuff that Google and Amazon do for free easily. And the reason they do it for free and easily is they have a commercial interest in it. They 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 use it for advertising or to sell you things and that kind of thing. And if people don't like that, then you're gonna have to you're gonna have to do the uh, work. Okay. If that makes sense. I would look at OpenHab. Uh, another thing that I had seen something new with was um open source project called Minecraft. But Yeah, Minecraft is a voice assistant, a very cool voice assistant named yeah, after when I was looking at it, they were saying that they were sending stuff back to their servers too though. Yeah, right. It's based on uh, that's Sherlock Holmes' brother, right? Minecraft. Um but that's the problem is that at least with current technology, uh the server has to do the work. And so, but I think that that's just a matter of time before um, we'll see on-device voice recognition. We're already seeing it on, a, on iOS and Android in certain circumstances. So that's coming because of people like you who quite rightly say, well, I don't want you to be listening. They're doing it for technical reasons, but it's nice because they also get information, which, you know, Google is in the business of gathering information and using it to sell advertising. And I, I think in the long run, much, do much more. If you look at what Google announced at their developer conference, it was all about how, because we know a lot about you, you can say things to the Google Assistant like, what should I cook for dinner? And it knows what you like. It knows what recipes you've cooked in the past. It could in some day even know what's in your fridge. That's a great, I think that would be cool. But a lot of people say, well, I don't know, want Google to know what's in my fridge. <laughs> so yeah, Minecraft is a really interesting project. Are you, have you done kind of this kind of hobbyist programming? Have you used a Raspberry Pi, that kind of stuff? Uh, I'm, I majored in computer science. Perfect. In college. You're I the master's degree in it. Oh my God, you're the guy. Well, then everything I've told you, you already knew probably, right? I mean, you understand how this works. I, I knew that it could be done, but I didn't know. If anyone was doing it, yeah, it takes the reason it's it's hard to do is it takes a lot of storage. So, in fact, one of the things Google crowed about was we've taken a 500 gigabyte uh, machine learning file, a training file, and we've compressed it down to 50 megabytes or something like that. It was a huge mm -hmm. compression, and that is all about enabling it on a mobile device. So you need the processor, you need the RAM, and you need the storage because you have to have those training models have to be stored locally. Yeah, I can. Set up a home server in my house, perfectly fine. Of yeah. whatever computer. So, Open Hab would be a great choice for you. That's okay. that because that is a purely private uh, home automation solution that works with almost every device. And then you could maybe use Mycroft to control it, or you could use an existing assistant to control it. But you could do it in a way that's more constrained. You know, you'd have more control over it. I think that's a great idea. Okay. Yeah. If you you've obviously got the skills to do this. That's the problem. Most people don't. And most people just go, yeah, whatever. I don't care. <laughs> so Google knows all about me. Big deal. And I, I, that's kind of my attitude. I, it's not, for me, a skills issue. It's a time issue. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today? Good to see you. Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Yeah, it's time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches. Uh, I don't know, anything with a chip in it. Electric vehicles, microwave ovens. Uh, I don't know much about them, but I, we, if we'll find a reason. 8888-ASK-LEO, car, cameras, um, anything with a chip in it. Augmented reality, that kind of thing. 8888-ASK-LEO, that's my phone number. I'd love to hear from you. If you want to talk high tech, I'd like to talk about it with you. Website has all the details. Everything we talk about is available at Tech Guy Labs. Dot com techguylabs.com that's free there's no sign up you can even leave your comments your thoughts there and i'd love to hear from you if you have additional information you'd like to add to uh, the answer in fact all the answers are there uh at first with text james deruvo writes that down and then later we uh, 
we add audio and video too, so you can actually listen to the question. And if it's you, you can you know send it to your friends, and uh, and and listen to the answer too. You might not want to send them to the friends. Bernie in San Diego's next. Hi, Bernie. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hello, hello, Leo. Hello, Bernie. I got, I got a uh, pop up when attempting to log into Facebook called authorization. Unfortunately, due to unforeseen technical issues with the online system, we're having difficulties identifying you. You'll have to prove your identity by providing the information requested below. And they want my credit card number? Uh, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> well, Facebook. I, I, mean, I, 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 I have not done it. I've Good. Been, I'm, I'm waiting to, to ask you what's going on. If you uh, know. That's uh, definitely not Facebook. So Facebook does occasionally ask you to confirm your identity. Usually it's uh, if something happened to your account or you're creating a new account. But if it does ask for that, uh, it will usually ask for a government photo ID, something like a driver's license or a passport, um, or even a piece of mail with your name and address on it. I've never heard of them asking for a credit card. And, of course, you're right. That should immediately set off alarm bells because what could they do with that credit card? Oh, charge things to it. That's what that occurred to me, too. <laughs> yeah, anytime you get asked for that kind of thing, uh, that's cause for suspicion. So it, there, I think what it is, a bad guy playing with you, hoping that you want, you've heard, perhaps, that Facebook sometimes asks for additional uh, verification. If they think your account, if you're using a pseudonym, uh, you know, because Facebook wants you to use real names. There are reasons that Facebook might trigger that, but they're never going to ask for a credit card number as far as I know. In fact, I'm looking on the Facebook page, and, uh, well, it says if you've lost access to your account, you might be asked to provide a credit card, but never do that. Only provide them with an image of you and something that can't harm you, like even a... They would Except a vehicle insurance card or, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't have to even be legal identification. It could be, uh, you know, email or not email, but um, uh, snail mail for a bill, that kind of thing with your address, name and address on it. They even say a yearbook photo in some cases, a utility bill, a diploma. So if you go to the Facebook uh, site, I'll put a link to the Confirm Your Identity with Facebook support page. But under no circumstances should you give them a credit card, even though they might accept that. Do they tell you <laughs> where do you, are you supposed to enter in the credit card number? It, it wants my credit card number, the expiration date, the, the security code, of course. And the zip code. Yeah, that's a hack. That's a hacker. They don't need that. And what they want is a picture of you with it is what Facebook wants. And don't ever even then use a credit card. But absolutely, if they're asking you to fill out a form. Now, the question is, how did you get how did you get that's what, that? That's what I want to know. Yeah. So you're sure you're sure you're on well there's yes there are many scams like that. You're sure you're on facebook.com. Oh yes, I log into this same page all the time. So here's what I would do. Close your browser fully, close all browsers. In fact, best thing, close all applications. Open yes. your browser and with just that one tab open, type facebook.com. And okay. and you'll get the login page. If you still get that pop-up, that's a greater cause for concern. That means there is malware on your system that oh, is boy. triggering that. But I bet you won't. And I bet what's happening is there's another page open in a tab. There's, you know, that's why I want you to close everything and start fresh typing it in. If you type it in and you type in Facebook.com, sometimes people will hijack sites by, for instance, I, I remember I went to, by accident, I went to, Instead of Twitter, T-W-I-T-T-E-R, I went to T-V-V-I-T-T-E-R. And it looks on the page, if you're not looking closely, just like Twitter. But in fact, it's a hacker has set up that site. Oh, as a, and, and then if you go there and not know you're on the wrong side. So maybe you typed Facebook with an O instead of, with one O instead of two. Or, a Z, you know, maybe you mistyped it. That's why I'm saying go close everything. Open a sing single browser page. Type in carefully, F-A-C-E-B-O-O-K dot com. Nothing else. No ex additional stuff. Use the log on page there. And I bet you, you will not see that pop up. And good on you for saying, well, hold on there. Yeah. Hold on. I got it from, 
uh, from a bookmark that I have. That, I use the same bookmark every day. Yeah, so it should, in theory, be okay, but maybe delete that bookmark. I, it also okay. could be remembered. There, there, there are there are all sorts of weird attacks. If you had another browser tab open to a page that wasn't so nice, maybe that did it. But that's interesting. You didn't type it in. The, uh, what version of uh, what operating system are you using? What version of Windows? Seven. Okay. So Windows 7 January is going to be out of update. So be start good time to think about updating. You you do run your regular Windows updates though, right? Through 7, yeah. Yeah, you always are updating every month or every second yeah, Tuesday. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um I think probably also prudent if you get if you do this by hand and you get it again to clear your first of all see what browser extensions you have. Sometimes when you download software from sites, they install stuff that you don't really want on oh. your browser. So look at your browser extensions and delete or disable. Actually, better to uninstall, not disable any extension you don't know. Okay. Um, you might also want to clear your history and cache. Maybe not history so much, but cache for sure uh, on All the right. browser, just in case something bad got, got stored. Extensions are the real problem. And then there's this thing called browser hijacker objects. They can get on there, and it, if you had a browser, a sophisticated browser hijacker object on there that was waiting for you to go to Facebook, and then popped up that pop up, that would be that would be a smart attack. So you you had exactly the right instinct. Absolutely, never fill out that credit card number. Uh, face. It, 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 it looks so authentic, you know. Of course, I can make it look authentic. All it takes is a little blue, a little gray, a little white, a little text. It's not hard to duplicate those pages. That's that's the easiest thing. In fact, they don't even have to know anything. They can copy and paste the the CSS code from the page itself. So it is in fact identical. The difference is it's not it's not going to Facebook. It's going to the bad guy and you don't want that. Okay. All right. All right thank you. Thank you, Lou. Hey, my pleasure. Thank you for having the uh, good sense to say, wait a minute, this isn't right. And you've actually helped a lot of other people who are listening because now they know, oh, <laughs> Facebook doesn't ask you for the credit card, huh? Oh, okay, good to know. <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Still a little bit of a show left. I hope you'll stay tuned. And if you've got a question, call 8888-ASK-LEO. Oh, I love our show sponsor. I got to talk about LastPass. I get to talk about LastPass. You know me. I've been promoting LastPass for more than a decade. So I started using them about 10 years ago. It's the best password manager out there. It works everywhere. Windows, Mac. I use it on Linux. They've got plugins for all the browsers. It's the most secure. Steve Gibson assured me of that when he interviewed uh, Joe Segrist, the creator of LastPass. Joe even showed him the code and everything. Steve said, yeah, these guys are doing it right. And the thing is, that's why I love LastPass, because I I know my favorite security experts, people who really know this stuff, have taken a look at it and said, yes, thumbs up. One of the things that's great about LastPass, you're, it's a password vault, I guess I should explain this, that holds all those passwords. You shouldn't have to remember them. And in fact, if you're trying to remember them, that means you're probably also using bad passwords, because a good password is long, random, and completely unmemorable. So you wouldn't even want to write it down. And LastPass generates those, stores them. All you have to remember is your one master password and you're golden. But that's the key. LastPass only decrypts at device level. So no one has access to your password vault. Not LastPass, not a bad guy, only the person who knows that master password. We use LastPass at work too because, of course, employees are a common attack point for bad guys. And when employees have the passwords, they have the keys to the kingdom. Do your employees at your business have the keys to your kingdom, the bank accounts and the website and the servers and the, all of that stuff? You need LastPass. We can give our accounting department access to our checking accounts and QuickBooks without even giving them a password. We just share it with them. They click it. It opens it up. They'll, all they see is dots. They'll never know. And that's good because we know employees... About more than half of employees share passwords, not just with people at work, too, with their friends. So keep keep these passwords under lock and key with LastPass. The LastPass Enterprise is great. That's what we use at TWIP because it gives you uh, 100 different admin policies. So you can keep track of things like the strength of the master password. 
you can force, as we do, two-factor authentication. In fact, LastPass is a great authenticator. Is LastPass premium for personal use? LastPass for teams of 50 or fewer? And, of course, LastPass families. There's a LastPass for everybody. 13.5 million people use LastPass. I use LastPass. I have for years, and now I'm very happy I can spread the word. Go to lastpass.com slash twit to find out more. lastpass.com slash twit. We thank them for our supporting our podcast, and I thank you for using that address, that special URL, because that shows them you heard it here, and that supports us. lastpass.com slash twit. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888. Ask Leo. Fred's on the line from Fraser Park, California. Hello, Fred. Uh, hi, Leo. How you doing? I'm wonderful. How are you? I'm good. I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Why does Apple hate the blind? <laughs> you know, Apple is notorious. I'm surprised to hear you say that. They're famous for their accessibility. You, wh what device are you having trouble with? Um, th this will take a little background. Okay. Um, I'm a college teacher. I was. I started teaching in 76. Uh, my field is visual arts, specifically photography, uh, not just taking pictures of your puppies, uh, scientific, technical, the whole thing. Nice. And one of the things that happened in 76 when I started teaching, my vision was totally wiped out. Ugh. It was part of a credentialing process. I know that sounds weird. Well, they wanted me to be an executive at the college. They put me through a meat grinder. The last two or three years, my vision has just been completely shot. I'm so sorry. Gosh, that must really, for somebody in the visual arts, that's got to hurt. No, not really. Um, it's been a le learning experience. I like to study stuff. And no matter what's going on, I want to learn about what I'm dealing with. And what I found w was the telephones, consumer electronics, and appliances are absolutely user-friendly, not just for people with visual problems, but also, also a lot of other problems. If you have dexterity problems, problems with touch and things like that. And I, I've gone so far as to really study it. I mean, pretty emphatically. And as an example, I'm talking to you right now on a portable phone, mm -hmm. not a cell phone, a portable phone. Mm -hmm. If you look at one of those phones closely on the number five, there's a little bump. Yes. That allows you to make phone calls if you can't see very well. You know well. where to place your fingers, yep. Yeah, exactly. Now, one of the things, ironically, that's happened is the advent of the touch screen, which for people with visual problems, they're useless. I mean, they're an absolute nightmare. Apple came out with Siri, which, when you think, I downloaded somewhere after 2015. I was still seeing fine. And quite frankly, I couldn't even use it when I could see the screen. It, it was very, very unfriendly. And one of the other things I ran into was cooking. Microwaves, by and large, have touch pads. Now, there's a solution for that. There's a product called Bumps, which I'd heard about in the 80s. And they're like a little bump that have a strong adhesive on them. And if you know somebody that can see, they can put them on different buttons for you on the touch pad. But touch screens are a nightmare. And, well, they're not a nightmare. They're completely unfunctional. And so the issue of accessibility has been a really big issue for me. Um, some years ago, I bought a little flip-flop phone. It was advertised in AARP magazine. I bought it. Not, I could see fine then. I bought it because we don't have cell coverage in my immediate area. We're in the mountains, and we're in a dead zone. Um, if I drove three miles or three and a half miles towards a cell tower, I could pick up a crummy signal and I could use it. But as far as using it at home, there is no reason to buy an ex expensive cell phone. Well, uh, the good news and bad news, uh, the good news was that AT&T was going to build a cell tower in our area, which they did, and it was activated earlier this year. Oh, goody, I'll be able to use my little flip-flop. Um, the flip-flop is actually a rebranded Samsung. Uh, the buttons are really close together. Um, let me, let me. Unfortunately, I, don't, I have limited time. Let me just ask you: Have you used try using the accessibility features on an iPhone like VoiceOver? Uh, uh, all that stuff is worthless. It okay, because I, I know a great number of blind users. Now, admittedly, <laughs> uh, a touch screen is going to be less useful, but I know a great number of blind users who do, in fact, 
uh, use the iPhone and love the iPhone because of this voiceover capability. It will speak all the buttons. It'll let you know where your fingers are, what you're touching. Um, admittedly, uh, a touchscreen is a problem, um, but I honestly think that Apple's doing as well as anybody in this regard. Maybe they need to do a better job. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that. I don't. I, I have no standing to talk about this because I'm cited. In fact, I've often told people I don't. I, I really can't do fair coverage of accessibility hardware and software because I can peek and. <laughs> It, it just really gives you a, a, a completely different experience of this. But I have to say, I have talked to a number of people. In fact, I'm sure somebody will call because we have a lot of blind listeners who, who say, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm really able to use not just the iPhone with the Apple's accessibility technologies, but even a Mac or a Windows machine with uh, sometimes third-party programs like JAWS, which is a screen reader for Windows, uh, sometimes the built-in uh, technologies like the Zoom capabilities. Um, I have to say, voice might be your best friend in the long run. I do know many people with varying abilities who are able to use Amazon's Echo, for instance, to make phone calls using just their voice. So I think that that's, that's going to be, uh, in the long term, a, a hope for people. I, I feel your pain. Um, I, I feel like Apple and Microsoft are, I've even spoken to uh, the, uh, a person at Microsoft who's in charge of accessibility she gets to work across all product lines and go into any product division and say, guys, you're not doing a good job. You could do a better job. Here's where we should fix this. So these companies know this is important. I think it's very important. Uh, they're trying to add features like Siri voice dialing, like voiceover, Zoom text, and other features that make it easier for people with vision, impaired vision, you know, I mean, if you're deaf, it's also hard to use. Google just announced a really an amazing technology that duplicates the old TTY services that phone companies offered, uh, but with artificial intelligence so that you can look at a video. This, this was a remarkable demonstration at Google I.O. and have the captioning on. So somebody who is deaf or hard of hearing can actually start to get involved in life in, in new and unique ways. So there are, I do feel like there are solutions. I admit maybe we took a step backward initially with the touch um, screens, but that's the way of the world. And I do think that these companies care a lot. And you should absolutely, if you have some suggestions, write to Apple and their accessibility division because I think they would love to hear from you. I appreciate the call. I just, I don't have enough time to go any further into detail on that, but I do appreciate it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We were talking about Stevie Wonder because Big Pee Wee, my musical director used to work at Stevie's radio station. In fact, that's where we stole him from. I'm sorry, Stevie. And uh, he was talking about how Stevie uses his iPhone. Of course, Stevie's completely blind from birth, right? Uh, but he uses it with a really cool technology I've seen before. It's a Braille screen reader. And uh, what it, it does is it's kind of an amazing technology. It's a little thing. It only has a few lines. But what it, what it can do is um, I think it's I think it's from a company called Humanware. What it can do is push up bumps in real time so you can you can see the screen with your fingertips and see the text and all that. Read the text. It's an amazing technology. It's Stevie, of course, who I'm sure learned Braille uh, as a child in school. Uh, and which means he's, you know, highly literate in Braille. It, it's it's as fast using that as it would be for us looking at a screen. It's really cool, really cool. Ah, taking the higher ground there on the go with the show, Julian in Los Angeles. Hi, Julian. Hey, Leo. How's it going? Uh, it's going great. All right. Well, I am blind. I'm also an assistive technology trainer, and I heard your last call, and I feel really bad for that guy because clearly he uh, is not aware of the power of the accessibility that's built into these modern mobile devices. So, I, I also, to that. be fair to him, remember he's recently gone blind. Yeah, and I think and, that, and, and this is why people need people like you, Julian, because. It's one thing if you're like Stevie Wonder, blind from birth, and you get the support at school and so forth. You learn the skills. You have, you know, you, you, your brain is more mobile. You can learn those skills, and you can become quite adept. But, but if you're starting from zero, 
as an adult, that's got to be really challenging, really hard. It is, but it's not impossible. I, I've taught newly blinded people, including veterans, and I've taught them how to use the iPhone, and they can use it. It's just a matter of uh, you basically, your brain has to retrain those cells that used to power the right. eyes to do other things. They, right. they need to work, and they learn to do other things. They don't just sit there because right. you lose your vision. No, so, the brain is amazingly plastic. It will use that vision portion of the brain for other things. It's kind of remarkable. Where could he go? How could somebody get that kind of help? Well, there's lots of places. Um, I mean, uh, he could find a trainer like me, and I'll give myself a cheap, shameless plug if that's okay. Please do. You have a, Don't give a phone um, number if you have a website is, or an email. Yeah, well, I have a website. My, my phone number's on there. It's a, it's a Google Voice business number, so people can call it any time. I don't okay. Care. Um, my website is www.techjv.com. That's www.techj, as in John, V, as in Victor, dot com. And there I've got lots of resources, including a page that I maintain of, of some of the apps that I find most helpful. In uh, fact, I see you have a presentation about using the iPhone 7. So yeah, that's awesome. It's an older thing, but I keep it around because it kind of gives people an idea of, yep. of how I work. So, awesome. Um, there's lots of stuff. So there's that. Um, there are places you can go to. The place that I think you and Big Pee Wee were talking about, referring to Stevie Wonder, I think it's called Wayfinder Industries. They're over in uh, in Los Angeles. Yeah, Stevie's a, a big supporter, uh, Pee Wee tells me. Damon tells me a yeah. big supporter of him. Yeah. So there's that. There, there's companies like Sweetman Systems out of the valley here. There's there's A.T. Cratter in Orange County. There's lots of companies that do this. There are companies you can go to. National Braille Press has publications. Uh, one of them is called Getting Started with the iPhone, and it's written by a, a blind person. Do the, do uh, the traditional one? organizations like Lighthouse for the Blind or the Braille Institute, do they, do they also understand these new technologies and assistive technologies? Oh, yes, and Braille Institute has uh, something uh, that, that they, uh, they, they have a whole, they call a connection point. And it's a place you can go into and you can get matched up with somebody to teach you at least the basics and get you started. So there's lots of stuff. There's a, w a wonderful website called applevis.com, A-P-P-L-E-V-I-S.com. And it's all about getting started with, with Apple products. They've, in fact, they have sections there with tutorials specifically to help people who are new to this. That's fantastic. So there's I'm, a lot of stuff out there. It's doable. And he was talking about the uh, problems with uh, putting bumps on the phone with touchscreens. Yep. There's actually companies that make overlays that have dots because one nice thing about Apple is that everything's consistent in iOS. So there are dots that line up with certain buttons. They oh. even have overlays that line up with all the letters on the keyboard so you can slide your finger oh. around if that helps you. Cool. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there. And I, I just felt really bad for that guy, and I felt that he should know about this because he sounded frustrated. And yeah. you know, the iPhone's a very powerful tool. It, it will give him all kinds of abilities that he probably never thought he'd be able to have again once he uh, lost his vision, and it's not the case. I can only imagine how hard it must be to lose your sight, especially as a visual artist, uh, and, and, and especially as an adult. But um, that's good news that it's, you know, there's hope. And it's just going to take a little uh, work, a little research. And I think a good place to start is your page, Julian, techjv.com. I'm so glad you uh, called in uh, to, to talk about it. Because I, I think I've talked to you before. I know I've talked to many people before who have sung the yeah, praises. we've actually uh, we've met. I've been to your Brickhouse Studios before, oh, yeah. back in, I think, 2016. <laughs> nice. Oh, great. Well, I'm glad we met. And uh, you're in the L.A. area, but uh, all over the country there are places like this. I think it's... Oh, yeah, definitely. And you know what? Another tip, if, if he's in an area and he's not familiar with the people, there are chapters of the National Federation of the Blind and the American Council of the Blind, and you look them up and call those chapters up and say, hey, do you guys have a tech guru who, uh, who knows nice. how to teach this stuff? Maybe yeah. I could take him to lunch, or maybe yep. he does this for a living. Yep. So there's lots of ways he can get information. There'll, there'll be resources uh, for him. The website for the dots, I think, is speeddots.com. Am I correct? Yes. Yep. Yes. Thanks to uh, Echo Steven in our uh, chat room. He says, we put those on my uncle's phone, speeddots.com. Well, JV, I'm so glad you called. I appreciate it. Likewise. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, It's got to be hard. I have every bit of uh, understanding, uh, and, and, I, and I can only imagine what I would be going through. Uh, I don't think I'd be... A <laughs> I'd be a very good patient or client. I'd be cranky as heck. Uh, but at some point, you sit down and you say, okay, let's figure this out. It is, I mean, it's really important to understand that as we move towards touch 
screens that this is going to be a particularly challenging technology for people who can't see. Uh, but technology is kind of like the human brain. It is very adaptable. And given the desire to do it, and I do really think the, all these big temp tech companies have a huge interest in doing this, uh, some real skill and smarts in, in the people who are you know, creating the hardware and software, uh, I think it's possible. And I, I, I have to say, I should have asked Julian about this, but I have to say I think voice is going to be a really interesting technology going forward for people who can't see. And for people who can't hear, as I mentioned, I think there's some very interesting technologies, AI technologies coming along that will help. One of the videos that Google showed at their developers conference at Google I.O. Uh, was a video, just an amazing video about an Indian woman who never learned to read. She was, she's illiterate. And imagine going through life. She said, I have to ask people this. What does that sign say? You know, how do I buy these tickets? What's, so much of what we do, we have to read instructions. We have to be able to read. And she was using a Google technology, which would work for blind people as well, by the way, that you could point. It's, uh, Google's building it into all their phones. It's called Lens. That you'd point at a sign. It would, it would, it would translate it, and it would say it out loud to you. It would... It would it would read you the signs. And she says, my life has changed. Go, the video is, I'm sure, at the Google I.O. website. I'll, I'll find it and I'll put a link on the show notes because it's the most touching, moving thing. She says, I got my life back because I can now read even though I can't read. I can now get around. I can buy my own tickets. I can read instructions. I can take the, the, the bus. That's, that's pretty exciting. So technology, I think, in the long run can help. As long as the technologists understand the needs and, and are responsive, and I think in many cases they are. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Mm -mm -mm. It's so good. If you like the music, well, you can thank one person. Big Pee Wee, our uh, musical director, Damien, is so great. Love having him working on the show. He joined us a few months ago, and man, I don't know how we, uh, how we survive without you, Pee Wee. Same for Kim Schaffer, our phone angel answering the phones. But most of all, it's you that makes this show. You're my co-host. Uh, your calls make it uh, happen. So I really uh, am grateful. Thank you. I'm grateful to get to do this every week. It's so much fun. Someday I hope to get paid. No, no, just kidding. Rachel in Springfield, Illinois. Hi, Rachel. Leo Hi, Leo. How are you? <laughs> you know, every time I say things like how much I like the job, I think, oh, God, I hope the boss doesn't hear this. <laughs> Aren't you the boss? No. <laughs> well, I'm not the boss of the radio show. I do have my own podcast network where I am the boss at Twit. But uh, radio show, no, I have Yeah. I have yeah, people true. I have to, I have to, and they're wonderful people. I really love the team at, uh, at, at Yeah, I, I actually do have a tech job and I do get paid for it. I've talked to you several Isn't times. Isn't it nice I've to actually, get paid for doing something you it love? Is. It is. Man. Yeah, I um, I met you up at the Brick House and um, just like uh, your last caller. I'm also blind. Um, and I bet the, uh, by the way, Big Pee Wee, you're doing an awesome job. Love the love the funky stuff. And Kim, you're doing a great job too. Oh, they're <laughs> blushing. But, uh, <laughs> neither one of them were there when I was up there. So, uh, but uh, so you brought your you brought your dog too, right? You know, I was in training with her, and the school recommended because she was so new not to bring her to the um, oh. and, and you gave me a hard time about it. I think did you leave her in the car? No, no, no. Oh, no, good. She was at the school. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, we love it. We love it when the service animals come in. We love that. Yeah, yeah. She was so new at the time. Yeah. That I, no, I, no. You got to be careful when you're starting out with a service animal. Yeah, yeah. She's my fourth, and she's oh, awesome. How's she doing? Um, she's awesome. She does a great job. I've had nice. her for six years now, and and I totally expect uh, that when I go back to the school, I'm I'm gonna definitely have to pay you a visit. So. Yeah, because they're just down the road. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was so excited when I knew I was gonna go to that school. Hey, we need to report that. They're asking, hey, people, what do you want to do on Sundays? Go shopping? Or I said, no, I want to go see, I little, see the tech school. guy. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Very well, nice. Here, they're just in San Rafael. They're training school guide dogs yeah. for the blind. Yeah. And uh, they're really a, a great organization. We know a lot of people who 
uh, take the dogs in their first year to, you know, the beginning part. And uh, they're just sweet animals, really sweet. Puppy raisers are the best because they, they get the hard job. They're all trained by the time we get them. And That's right, yeah. So, uh, yeah. But, nice. yeah, I, I would love to at some point talk to you off the air. I have some, some tech ideas for you that I'd like to run by you. And I had sent you some emails that probably went into your spam filter or something. <laughs> oh, my email box is a sad, sad story. It's just, <laughs> so I is get, mine. <laughs> I get so much email. And I often miss stuff, so send it again, uh, and I will, and I'll, and I'll just, you know, I'll make a point of looking, looking for it. What I'll do is I'll, um, I can also give Kim my number too, okay. and, and pass that on nice. to you. But that'd be great. Yeah, the braille display that CB Wonder was probably using. I, I came in on the tail end of that conversation, so I didn't hear it. Um, but he was probably using the Brilliant, which is from Humanware. Humanware, and yeah. um, I've used that as well, and I got a lot of Humanware. Um, I've been using humanware stuff for a long time and I use stuff from other companies because it's my job to learn and use all the tech. So I'm very fortunate like you that in my job, I get to play with all the stuff and, uh, you know, try it out and kind of find out what works for what situations. And, um, so yeah, I, I do you work, are you independent? Do you work for somebody? I work for Illinois assistive technology program. Fantastic. So That's it's great. the, um, the Tech Act program for the state of Illinois. So each state has one, and they have several different programs that are involved in that. They have, a, just in generally speaking, a lot of them have like a device loan program. You know, when you're talking to high tech, you're talking dollar signs. And, you know, when when you're wanting to figure out if something works for you, you don't want to have to buy it first. They're so they expensive, say, oh, although yeah, often yeah. I know you can get help, government help and so forth, but still... These devices yeah. really uh, are very expensive. I can only imagine what the humanware uh, Braille yeah, reader costs. Yeah, yeah. but uh, you know, but they'll work with you too. But um, yeah, so we have like a device loan. We have a demo center where nice. all the tech sits, and people can come try it out. And, Fantastic. Um, then the what I do is I travel around the state and I train people on the technology. So if somebody is working or going to school and they need you know a computer or PC with Windows or an iPhone or iDevice Braille display. You know, screen reader, screen magnification, uh, um, voice recognition, all that kind of stuff. I can train them on that. Nice. So, so the point for our caller is look for resources in your area. They exist, Absolutely. and you can get somebody to help you, to train you, and you might be amazed at what you can do with the with even the iPhone. Uh, a lot of the ex existing technology really is set up to make it a little easier for you. And your last caller um, was totally in, in on uh, with that, with the, Julian, yeah. the books that were out through, um, and also National Braille Press, I yep. think is one he said, yep. and, um, you know, Good. Apple Viz, that's a great resource. So Good. there's a lot of resources out there, and go to the Tech Act program as well in your state. Just do a Google on the Tech Act program, and you should be able to find something. And if they don't know the answer, they can at least point you in the right direction. Rachel, thank you so much. Please come Absolutely. back next time you get a new puppy. And I'll uh, and this before then because you've moved since I was there. We so are in the new music. East Side Studios. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so come by any time. We, I will we, do. We, uh, just so people understand, it's not just on the weekends when I do the radio show. You're more than welcome then, but uh, we do other shows all week long. And best thing to do is to email tickets at twit.tv. Twit is the podcast network, This Week in Tech. And that way, uh, somebody's saying in the chat room, my, my buddies came by with their Airstream, but nobody was there on Monday. Yeah, you, 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 our schedule varies, so it's good to email ahead of time. Make sure we'll be around, and that way we know absolutely. you're coming too. Tw tickets at twit.tv. Thank you, Rachel. I'll in my number if, if that would help. Yeah, anybody. I'll put you on hold. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, and Kim, All the best. Kim will be with you in a moment as I All figure right. out how to do hold. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this technology stuff's really hard. Our show <laughs> James in Albuquerque. Hello, James. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hello, how's it going? It's great. How are you? Oh, pretty good. I was listening to your bit on electric cars a little while ago. I've become a huge fan. Uh, I have been for a long time of Electric vehicles, just the battery technology hasn't been there. But that's well, but that's the weird thing. You know, everything else is moving at, at a great pace, but batteries, it doesn't seem like we've made any big inventions. I guess I guess the lithium-ion batteries are as good as it's going to be for a while until somebody comes up with something better. Well, they're good enough. That's Yeah. I mean, I'm, I get to both my Tesla and this new Chevy Bolt we just bought, 230 miles per charge. That's pretty good. 
gets me where I want to go. And now the Chargers are getting more common. That's even, you know, better. Uh, actually, what I'm looking at is that Outlander plug-in hybrid. Ah, I like plug-in hybrids because then you have a gas engine as well, so you don't ever have to worry about range. Right. Yeah, And also it's, it's got a already got an inverter in the back for 120 volt. And nice. Is that a Mitsubishi? All that kind of stuff. Is that a Mitsu I guess. Mitsubishi? I'll have to look yeah, at it. I am going to be in the market in about a year and a half for a new car, so uh, my lease runs out. So uh, that's when I'm going to check it out. Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan. We talk a lot about electric vehicles, thanks to our car guy Sam Abul Samid. Thank him for being here today. Uh, thanks to Chris Marquardt, too, our photo guy. Thanks to you for being here. Lots of thank yous, uh, but <laughs> a reminder, too, if you uh, hear something on the show and you want more information, we put we try to put links for everything up on the website, techguylabs.com. That is free. There's no, uh, no charge, no sign-up even. And you can leave comments if you have an additional material. I know we weren't able to get everybody today, but always welcome to leave comments on the website, techguylabs.com. I'm Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Hey, have a great Geek Week. We'll see you next time. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon. This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.